Hi, everybody. You're watching The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Very funny guest in the building, Alice Waterland. Hello. How are you? Hi, Nice DJ. to meet you. What's <laughs> nice going on? Nice to meet you. Um, I'm just here in New York promoting my comedy special. Yes. <laughs> Which camera is it? For Amazon. <laughs> Uh, my mama is a human, and so am I. Yeehaw! That yeehaw is not part of it. They said that afterwards. Well, you got a little country in there towards the yeah, end. Yeah, I did, and I did this before Lil Nas X. <laughs> so it was cool be song, before that. Making country cool again. Mm. Yeah, because part of my material is about country music and the alien conspiracy therein. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And not all this Area 51 stuff. I know. Yeah. And Lil Nas X, it's like, oh my God, it's I'm I'm so ahead of my time. You're a trendsetter. I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> Oof. It's crazy. It's it's a heavy hangs the head mm. that wears the crown, but you know. Well, I had a fun time watching it this morning. <laughs> I know not everybody is going to see this until later on, but it was hilarious, honestly. Thank you so much. And I really Thank enjoyed you. it. And I was just talking to Elise, your publicist, off camera. And it's just fully vulnerable and honest. Like it's just your life. This is who you are, and you just laid it out there for an hour. Yeah, I guess I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've talked about like it's taken a long time to put this thing together, yeah. like ten years in the making, but. How do you actually go about setting things up for this? Oh, for the special? Yeah, like, for the special. Yeah, I mean, to me, I was always like, why do a special? You just burn all this material. Mm. And then it got to a point where I was like, God, I'm sick of this material, and I need to burn it. And, you, you know, you just it's like a Marie Kondoing of your material that you've been working on. You, some of it, you just has to go, and it's still good. Mm. And... So then you, it's literally like, uh, this is good, this is a good joke that I love, but I can't keep telling it for the rest of my life in the same way. So let's put it, let's print it, you know? I guess that's the way it's done. And I, I always thought, why wouldn't you want to just save all your material like a hoarder <laughs> and never do it special? <laughs> it was just, we didn't know what to do. We self produced it mm -hmm. um, with Comedy Dynamics. And I was very specific about what I wanted. So they were awesome. They were like, they let me be completely hands-on about every aspect of it, and then, uh, and then we just kind of tried to sell it, and Amazon picked it up. And Amazon is obviously all over the world, so yeah. we've had some comedians yeah, so that. Yeah, so to Belgium. Yeah, so Belgium, yeah. Austria, you Thank got God. that whole market taken yeah, care of. Yeah, huge relief. So it's like Whole Foods, and then oh, cool. Let's yeah. see what Alice has to say. Yeah, yeah, and I've always wanted to be in Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Whole Foods does make it into the special too. Yeah, it does. You have a little bit there. <laughs> And that's not cross-branding. No. Because you know, at the time, remember, I right. didn't know Amazon was going to buy it. So anything you Again. hear in there. You're, you're just seeing into the future with all this stuff. Whole Foods, country. I'm a bit of a soothsayer. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's the next thing? What should I be on the lookout for um, here? I think there's, gonna be, there's still going to be um, racism. Mm. It's still going to happen. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't not a bold do. take there, yeah. No, but some people think it's a bold take. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently all Republicans <laughs> think it's bold to say that it exists. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm really, really excited to have this. And I hope, yeah, I hope you see it. <laughs> Just don't know what camera is. <laughs> there you go. Boom. Well, we're keeping you on your toes here. Yeah, it's That's true. how we do it. Yeah. Speaking of my toes, how about these shoes? Yeah, look at those Thank shoes. So much. <laughs> hey. Specifically for your time here in New York? Yeah, I got these. These are from Freda Salvador. They're really amazing shoes, and they have a little block heel here um, that looks like you could keep stuff in it, but you can't. No. No. No keys and no. anything like that? No. Doesn't no. work? Don't you look at my shoes. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned how you were saving jokes for the special. Mm -hmm. Like, I watched you do your thing on Conan, yeah. and you're using that joke about being a mom, yeah. and using it here. Yeah. So how do you deal with the pressure to make new jokes, and then yeah. also just using the stuff that actually you like, and it hits? Um, well, I recorded that Conan set before I knew I was doing a special. So in a little, in a way, it's like, you know, I know, I see your gotcha questions. No gotcha questions. I see your gotcha questions. <laughs> you know. That's the, an the anti-gotcha question. <laughs> um, so I, I guess, like, I'm, uh, it, I, I love stand-up. It's my favorite thing in the world to do and to watch. So writing new material feels really good to me. It's the be it, like there's no feeling in the world besides like getting a new joke mm. and getting it to work. They're just like the greatest feeling. It's like your brain gets tickled. So <laughs> it's my ASMR. <laughs> so um, 
I that's it, generally that's the impetus for writing new material. Now there is pressure after having a special come out that, you know, I'm now I'm doing a string of shows in Philly next mm. week and like do I have an hour, a new hour to fill right. that time? You know, there's going to be some repeats, but I try to make it fresh for them, fresh for the Phil Philadelphians. You know, they like it fresh. Good crowd there fresh. in Philly, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there, there's pressure, but it's it's part of the fun, I think. Yeah. And part of the fun also is touring around the country and hitting all these different spots. It's amazing. So what has it been I like bu it. building this whole thing out in terms of the stand-up career? Building my stand-up career, yeah. fantastic. There's n absolutely nothing like stand-up. There's no, I feel like art form, and I do think it's an art form. Absolutely. There's no art form where you're closer to your audience. There's no separation between your you and your material. It's this one and the same, right? Like it's even if you're doing like one-liners, it's like, hey, here's my idea from my head right now coming out of my mouth, and then your response is from your audience who's also right there, right in front of you, and they get a yes or no right away. It's a laugh it's or a no laugh, right? It's yeah. instantaneous, So it's like instantaneous, which is very hardcore. Mm. It's a very thrilling experience to like know right away whether or not like, yes, we like your <laughs> ideas, or like, no, they are garbage. Or, oh, crap. Um, which I, I love that. Yeah. I love the immediacy of it. Because you got to like respond. It. Yeah, and I love going all over the country and seeing how different people respond and making it, that makes me better, you know? Bad crowds make a better comedian. Just the way it is. Yeah. So yeah, I've had a great run. Well, even in your special. <laughs> yeah, I've had a great run. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, thanks. Well, all thank set. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody who supported me <laughs> on this journey. <laughs> well, even in your special, you're playing off the crowd too, and like there's something that you obviously know the different jokes you're going to get, but you never know what's going to happen with that crowd. You can't control them. Yeah. We've tried. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> We've tried. <laughs> We've given them pills. Uh, yeah, you, you never know what's going to happen, so you have to be ready. And I'm, I'm still not there. I'm still not at the point where I think I'm able to deal with any crowd situation. And I've been doing this for 10 years, so it's like that's one of the hardest things mm. doing stand up. Do you think you ever will be at that point? Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, I work really hard. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> but I work hard and I love it. So, yeah, I think I will, because it's as long as you have more goals and more plateaus to get to, mm -hmm. that's when you. And then when it gets when it gets to the point where like everything's easy, I'll quit. But there's not a lot of women comedians who have that experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think a male comedian I can't remember who it was recently was like I th I think it was Chappelle. He was like I going up. It's like I might not do this anymore because it's like you, no matter where I go, what I do like. This, I get a pretty good reaction, right. you know, and I don't think women have that no. yet. I don't think that, that the majority of audiences is, you know, and I'm blaming audiences, <laughs> like, there is no majority of audiences that are ready to hear all the things, all the jokes a woman has to say. It just isn't no question about the way it. Yeah. Um, the reality works right now. Um, that's not the way that, like, the patriarchy functions. So it would be cool to get to that point, but I don't, I don't think I'm there yet. So when do you get to the point where you feel like you can just say whatever you want to say? Because in your special, you talk about a lot of different things. Yeah. You talk about divorce. You talk about sex. You talk about a bunch of different things. Yeah. What, what are you holding back on that you haven't jumped things into? Things that are not funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so some I mean, darker that's stuff? The thing. I can't, you, you don't just go up there and say whatever you want to say. You've got to make a joke. Right. And that's like, otherwise, what's the point? It's not entertaining. It's not, it's not changing anything. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I feel like that's always going to be a hurdle, is knowing my own voice, mm -hmm. knowing how I appear to people, and you have to stay in touch with the reality that your audience is in touch with. Like, a lot of the problems that are cropping up now, I think, with um, male comedians mm -hmm. getting older, and any comedians, but especially white male comedians getting older, is there's this disconnect from the reality that people are experiencing in the world because their experience is so different. Right. They walk through life in a really different reality at a lot of the time, and then they're just like, why is everyone complaining all the time? <laughs> everyone is shouting and complaining all the time about all these problems that are not real, but they're just not real to that person. They really aren't real to that person, but, they're, but they can't, they have a hard time um, imagining other viewpoints. And to imagine other viewpoints, you have to kind of Im immerse yourself in other worlds. And, well, that's not been their 
experience of being funny their whole lives. I mean, Bill Burr didn't get to be Bill Burr by like hanging out with Black Lives Matter activists. Right. So it's really, you know, it, it's a conundrum. It's, it's a hard thing. I've had to, I've come a long way in learning how to listen and learning how to take the L mm. and be criticized and be checked on my privilege. It's not fun. And white people, we don't know how to listen very well. No. We don't, it's Or empathize with us. other situations. White liberals especially don't yeah. know how to um, think about the idea that other perspectives might be needed because mm -hmm. it feels like a condemnation of all the work that we've ever done or anything good we've ever done is canceled out because it hasn't included this voice or right. it hasn't included this perspective. And it's not. If somebody trusts you with their explanation of their experience, if somebody trusts you with emotionally, like doing the emotional labor of explaining their perspective, like that's sacred. That's mm -hmm. something that's really precious and you should take as a compliment. I mean, I don't talk to all guys about my experiences. So the ones I do choose should feel like they're, it's a compliment that I'm even speaking to them about it. Yeah. No, I totally get that. And there's specific reasons why you have that trust yeah. and why yes, you feel exactly. like you can do that. Whereas some other guys, there's yeah. no way you can have that conversation because they yeah. just, they don't get it. Yeah. You know? And what would be the point? Right. If it's really like they're coming into it hot, mm -hmm. what would be the point? And it's just not going to hit home yeah. regardless. I mean, the, the main thing for me is like, as I've done stand up um, over the years, I've become aware of what, what really is the thrill for me and the goal for me. Um, and in a lot of ways, my first job on Girl Code, mm -hmm. I've said this before, it might never get better than that for me because that was a job where I was literally using my own words and my own jokes to speak directly to young people. Right. And it had an incredibly wide audience. Yeah, that show cut through. A lot of reach. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, w what's better than that? There's not really a... I don't see a scenario in which that's going to, you know, happen again for me. Sure. It was lightning in a bottle. So, but over the years, I've learned that my my voice matters to people, and people are inspired by comedy, and people are reached by comedy and jokes and laughing and the like vulnerability of laughing. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from, especially young women who, you know, come up to me in grocery stores and they're like, "I saw you at this festival, and it was just like." I just felt like, oh, I was so depressed mm. because all these comedians were just talking about, you know, like masturbating and porn. Same and stuff over and over again. Came on stage and it made me feel lighter and um, unburdened, which is great. Like yeah. that's like, well, okay, yeah, I guess that is uh, something to be doing this for. And so, for me, it's not about like, I don't always have to like speak to your truth <laughs> right. or you know, right. it, being myself and being out there and talking and doing comedy and making people laugh and being funny and being myself is, is actually a choice that, it's a political choice. Sure. And it's something that inspires people, just leading by example. So who inspired you? Um, Chris Rock, honestly, for me, was like the turning point. I, I started doing um, comedy around the time that I started watching one of his specials. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I don't remember which one it was, but it was like he was, I remember he was doing something with his stand-up that was, I was like, oh, this is bigger than what I thought stand-up was, you know? This is bigger than like somebody, I had seen late night sets. Right. And he has, he took over the stage, it was a special, and I'd seen snippets and clippets of specials, but he was doing something larger and he was keeping this audience in this room captive like he was stalking back and forth um, in front of the stage on the front of the stage like he's going back and forth and like looking at the audience like he's keep he's hurting them you know and, like it, it was this physical expression and it, it was and then his, his writing was so phenomenal stuff I'd never heard and I I was like oh this could be something b and I was always looking for a way to be taken seriously as an artist so I went to art school mm -hmm. so like <laughs> Yeah, it just it made me think, and then I started improv, and then, and then I found all these other comedians like Sarah Silverman, Paula mm -hmm. Tompkins, and uh, yeah, a lot of people. What kind of art were you doing in art school? <laughs> oh my god, I, uh, like photography, sculpture, oh, wow. drawing, wow, painting, video, okay, printmaking, <laughs> graphic design, like. 
I was so busy. People mm. were like, stop doing so many things. Like, you were all over the board. <laughs> like, it was so bad. I just didn't know what to do. I did not know what to do. Mm. But neither did they. Right. It's art school. So when did comedy actually pop up into the picture for you? I was just desperate. <laughs> <laughs> I was so freaking out. I was like, I kn I'm supposed to be doing something. Like, I'm super... I'm an only child, you know, and like my family was always like, you're a star, mm. you know, and I, and I was like, I know, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I need a runway here. <laughs> and I tried so many things. And then when I started doing improv, something clicked and I, and I was like, okay, I'm good at this and I, ha I, I don't hate it and I want to do it for free. And when I started doing stand up, that was it. I was like, I will do this and never get paid, mm. you know, like. I thought maybe I'll languish in open mics for like a couple years, and I'm at the point where I still do open mics. Yeah, like you, I you need to. Love yeah. stand up. I will do it for free, but that's but not now. <laughs> now you're gonna to get pay paid. Me. And I well, when you have your I'm own gonna special. I'm going to age out of being able to be paid. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> but I'm going to take like, my checks for that. Give me some stage time, <laughs> like, and you're going to have to. I'll pay you, but yeah. So you were doing the UCB thing, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So how long did you do that for? Well, I didn't. I did classes. Right. So I went um, through all the way to 501, just for like six years. Yeah. Learned a lot. Um, never made it onto a Herald team, which mm. still a goal. Hey, uh, no, still kidding. time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I had a lot of fantastic teachers there. Yeah, and then I'm friends with some of them now, so that's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Were there people in your classes that are doing comedy now, doing yeah, stuff? Yeah, totally. Who are some of the people? Yeah, um, my friend Sean Perlman. Mm -hmm. He's where I'm, he's the person that got me into stand up. He's writing for Rick and Morty. Um, Zach Woods was one of my teachers. Okay. Um, you know what? Actually, I'm only friends with the teacher. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Catch up. <laughs> no, I don't. This is hard. I can't remember names. No, but you. you I could probably just be like, Craig. That guy, Craig yeah. Ziegler. <laughs> Craig Ziegler, yeah. Oh, he's doing great. But you come across all these different people because in your ten-year journey, whether it's doing open mics, opening up for people, yeah. you know, like you clearly come across people all along Certainly. the way. You do. You meet people. Lots of people. Yeah, not. <laughs> yeah. So how does Girl Code come up? People still come up to me about Girl Code. I bet they do. Yeah. Yeah. And how many years ago was that now? I mean. I don't, 19? I have no idea. Oh, yeah, like it was probably like eight, nine years ago. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And people will, um, like, yeah, in malls or whatever. <laughs> like, and what age group were we was, talking It used to be more often, which, and it was so fun because the Girl Code fan is the cutest and best fan because it's always shy. It's always like. <laughs> Because they see me as this huge celebrity, sure. you know, whereas people who know me from stand-up or even from, like, People of Earth or something like that, it's much more, they know it's not, like, a giant show mm. or whatever that I'm a huge celebrity. So they, they're like, oh, my God, People of Earth. But, like, people from Girl Code think I'm this, like, giant star because people on that show, it, it is to them. And, and, and they're like, oh, my God. You know, like, I had people in, like, I was in Nordstrom, and this guy was like, this guy was like, oh! You know, <laughs> that kind of thing is, like, the best, the best ever. You dig it. I love it. Well, because I probably wouldn't love it if it happened all the time, but it's sure. very rare. But you'll take when it. it does yeah. happen, I just, I want to just, like, ah, tickle you, you know, <laughs> which I shouldn't do. Uh, but, yeah. Awesome. It's cool when people appreciate your work, and especially something like that. Or yeah. that, that show just, you know, you got to talk about so many different I things. Know, so many different things. And also, like, <laughs> help a lot of different people and just being like, listen, we're going to talk about this right now. You yeah. may not be able to talk about it with your friends or yeah. with your family, but we're going to talk about it here on Girl Code. Yeah, it was crazy. They would send us these sheets, these beat sheets of what they were going to talk about, and I was like, this is a insane that we're going to talk about this. But we're doing it. And we're doing it. Mm. Yeah. So, was that your first foray <laughs> into TV? Mm hmm. And then commercial, commercial right? Yeah. You've done the commercial thing. You're yeah. doing that. Yeah. And then how does the whole movie TV show thing kind of come into the next chapter? God. Uh, I guess, you know what? I had a meeting um, with somebody from Point Grey Pictures, which mm -hmm. is Seth Rogen's production company, and they needed to recast a part in the interview. Right. Um, and that was the point where, you know, I had just come out of the UCB system and, um, 
I had that I was doing. So I did a scene with Tim Tim Simons mm -hmm. um, and Seth, and that was the scene I needed to do. And it was this improvised, really heavily improvised scene. This scene called for a lot of, and they knew I was I could improvise. And so they brought me in, and it was like three. I was so unprepared. It was three minutes of like a camera rotating around Seth and Tim and I as we like improvise this entire scene about like a breakdown on the show that we were like all the staff was like mm. managing and it was it was crazy like I was like this is bananas I just was inter I was just had a meeting yesterday and here got I cast the next day because they just needed somebody yeah. for this real this two second thing you know it wasn't going to be a part in the show and uh, the movie and then they liked me <laughs> and so I got to come back and uh, do a couple more days on set and hang out with Joe Mandy and stuff and it was really awesome so that kind of was the first I guess movie movie um, yeah, I did like guest star stuff here and there, and then uh, I auditioned for Mike and Dave, mm -hmm. and I got to do a table read for that. So I think my Chris Rock impression. That's what you led with in the table read. In the table read, there was a moment which the character does a Chris Rock right, impression. Right, right, right. And when I did that. That's when it hit. Yeah, it was like I was doing well. It was fine, and then the point at which she gets to the Chris Rock impression, mm. and I'm like. Destination <laughs> wedding. Like it, it's not a great impression, but like I really went for it, you know. And they were like, everybody was like, "What?" Like, all right, Ass has got yeah, some good too. It was like, well, this might be fun to bring her in. So yeah. Well, all the Chris Rock watching paid off for it, this moment. Yeah, it I mean, did. I had just been watching Chris really? Rock uh, before that. And that you had no idea before, that was coming. No, the night before the audition, and then I was like, oh, okay, okay, wow, that's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it paid off. That's awesome. Things happen for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, funny how that's thrown around a yeah. lot. Well, your character on Silicon Valley, I enjoyed it a lot because Thank it was you. just like a no BS, like <laughs> I'm going to go in there and just do my thing. What was it like playing that role for you? Some BS. <laughs> Some BS, yeah. So the uh, role involved, um, and this is something that some, every actor will come up against, an immense amount of techno babble, mm. which is, it's not babble, actually. They were very specific on the show about all the technical terms being accurate. And so there were, like, I could go through the scripts and be like, this is a thing, this is a thing. Very few things are not, are like just made up. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a coder. No. Of course. Yeah. So when I'm speaking in like a really technical language, it, it's like you're speaking nonsense words. It's like a whole different so language. Memorizing yeah. that is so difficult. And so it, it's just like, you, I tried really hard to be off book for that, but I just just was not. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of those you have to stick to the book. Like yeah. somebody's going like, you're going like, well, the the A frame is different than the main frame, and part of the line. <laughs> and like, it's like the sure codex, you got a good bit of that. You know, helix or whatever, and you're like, codex helix. A frame is different from the line. You know, it's just like forever. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it's a challenge. <laughs> really not. Yeah. yeah, but Carla was cool. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So do you feel like that put you out to a bigger audience? Definitely, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that was a hit show, got a bigger audience from that. I mean, it was a big deal because it was like the first female character that like, right. tried to exist in the house. And Especially infiltrating that world. For, you know, <laughs> hung in there for a little while. Mm. Uh, yeah, so that was awesome for me. For sure, for sure, yeah. And then for a while I had short blonde hair and everybody was like, you're yeah. a lesbian! And I was like, what? <laughs> you're like, wait, what? Wait a minute, there are lesbian actors, did you not know? So yeah. Was that your decision or was that the show's decision to have that look? Um, the show's decision because it was based on a real person. Gotcha. Yeah. So what was most surprising about entering that whole tech world, just in general, like separate from the show, what did you learn about Silicon Valley and just the tech industry in general? No, I, I mean, I didn't learn much from that show because my parents, like, or were, my, my stepdad is, it works in technology. I gotcha. He's an early adopter. Right, so, so, so I didn't second interact nature. before anybody else in my Yeah, how old are we talking about? Yeah, to? I was like, I don't know what year it would have been, but I, I remember being, like, old enough to go in a chat room, but young enough to, like, shouldn't go in a chat room, <laughs> you know? Like, I, gotcha. I was, like, eight or nine. Uh, and so... Yeah, I, I've I've known all about, and like we got Wired magazine before it was a big deal. Oh, super early adopter. So for sure, yeah, yeah. Like everybody, we had our own like internet portals and everything. Yeah, so I, I kind of knew a bit about Silicon Valley in that world um, for a really long time before 
before I was on the show. I used to do web design, actually. Really? Yes, I was actually a little <laughs> bit of a coder, but not. But, but when it was HTML, it wasn't. Sure. Like, not like super high tech. Not like real. Today. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when people check out your special coming up next month, mm -hmm. what are the biggest takeaways you want them to have? What kind of experience do you want them to have when they watch? Um, I just want them to, you know, sit back, crack open a beer or a soda, and fucking. Have a good time, man. It's all about sitting back, having a good time, and like doing you. Not do me. <laughs> you do you, man. You want to leave it on in the background, just playing over and over again. That's cool too, man. We'll take I don't that, get right? A lot of views, man. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess that won't be funny until you watch the special, and then it might also still not. Be funny. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did it to. I didn't do it to. Um, have any specific goal, to, you know, except for making a special that I thought was really fun and cohesive yeah. about me and presenting myself to the world. Um, but yeah, it, it should be a party. Yeah, I think I, it certainly was, was to it, me. Was yeah, I mean, you your uh, Cookie Monster story in New York was classic. Yeah, the whole Chicago experience took me on a trip there. <laughs> <laughs> do you identify with the edibles thing? I don't specifically oh identify my God. with it, but people do though. They know people what absolutely saying. know what yeah, you're yeah. saying. <laughs> That you get high and then you go to a whole different place. Yeah, yeah. And a little bit you stay that high for the rest of your yeah. life. Yeah. So that was, to, for somebody that hasn't experienced it, that was just hilarious. And it was fascinating. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> They're too strong. So, uh, yeah. I hope people have a great time. And they watch it many times. Mm. And then they tell their friends. And Absolutely. then they tell their dad. And I'm 25, so when you were talking about you're your... You're 25? I am 25. Oh my God. So when you are talking I thought about, you were like 18. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about your previous 25-year-old boyfriend, I'm like, all right. Yeah. I'll see you. <laughs> but you guys will see you once you check that we'll out. See. Anyway, yeah. that's Alice. I'm DJ Alice. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having you me. You got it. All right, everybody. See you next time here on The Sit Down.